Um, I'm excited tonight because I came to preach a message of freedom and breakthrough. Look at somebody and say, I'm ready for a chain to be broken. Ooh, I'm getting ready for a chain to be broken. I don't want to spend a lot of time with introductions and I just want to get right into the word. If you can, turn your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 8. Make sure I put my phone on silent. <laughs> Ooh. I'm believing in a move of God tonight. Yes. Ah, if you're there, say amen. All right. I'm done with all the pleasantries. I want to get right in. Um, verse 14. If you're there, say amen. Verse 14. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'll do is, is after I read that, um, put your fingers on that particular uh, portion of text, and then we're going to go to 1 Timothy, or sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1, um, verse 7. And then we'll just see where God takes us from there. Praise God. For those of you with digital Bibles, you can't put your finger there. I get it. Um, I don't know. What do you guys do? You guys uh, bookmark? You guys use the bookmark? Yeah. <laughs> finger. Just put your finger there. See, look, I got my finger. Boom. All right. Um, if you're there, say amen. 14. First Romans 8, verse 14. It says this, for as many... As are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For as many as are led by the Ruach, by the Numa, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together who the word of god ah it's a lot it's a lot in there um, i want you to go to second timothy chapter one the second epistle or the second letter <clears throat> Very rarely do letters get sent out when you're in jail. They get sent to you, <laughs> right? Um, but Paul is writing this letter. It's a prison letter. And in verse 7, it says this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Power. And of love. And of who? For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, sorry, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If I were to put today's message into uh, one sentence, if I can try to condense it all into one sentence, it would be this, that God wants to deliver his children from the spirit of fear that leaves them Powerless, unable to love, or able to exercise restraint. Let me say that one more time. God wants to deliver his children from the spirit of fear that prohibits them and leaves them powerless, unable to love, or to exercise restraint. Look at somebody next to you. And say, what are you scared of? What are you scared of? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> if 
you ask my boys, they would say daddy. <laughs> Dear Father, we ask tonight, Lord, that you would speak to me, or speak into me, speak through me. Let it not be my presentation, but Father, we just pray, Lord, that the words that are spoken, Lord, be acceptable unto you, God, for your people in this time. And we pray, Lord, that this word would conform us, it would sanctify us, it would cleanse us, it would convict us, but more importantly, that it would build us up, exhort us, and encourage us as we move forward, Lord God, and as we continue, Lord, to be sanctified in your word. And we ask that in your name, we pray, amen and amen. What are you scared of? Fear. False evidence appearing real. Y'all heard that before, right? The, the great poet and philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson said the following. He said, fear defeats more people than anything else. Fear defeats more people than anything else. But there's another quote that I like, and it comes from the president Franklin Delano Roosevelt, where he said in a speech, that the only thing to fear, y'all remember that one, that the only thing to fear is fear itself. It's profound because there is a part in which we partake in, but there's a part which is separate from us. That fear can be something you experience, but it can also be something that influences you. You see, brothers and sisters, there's a difference between experiencing fear and emoting fear. Can I say that again? There's a difference between experiencing fear, that is, the experience of fear, and the emoting of fear, that is, to be scared or to be afraid. I'll argue to you that emoting fear can be a good thing. Y'all with me so far? Emoting fear can be a good thing. Why? Because through emoting fear, it can heighten your sensitivity. That when you emote fear, it heightens your awareness. That emoting fear will push you to the bounds of your physical limitations. Fear can make you do things you never thought you could do. Proof? All right, back in the day, I was a rambunctious child. Um, if anybody knows me, I was precocious, rambunctious. I like to jump around. I was a problem. Um, even when now I tell people, yeah, I became a pastor, like, no way, no way, no way. You were the, you were the child from hell. Um, there's no way that could have happened. But anyway, I, remember I used to cause a lot of trouble. My mom had a friend in Delray who used to give mangoes because that's what Haitians do with Haitians. They give each other mangoes. Um, um, if you're a Haitian with a mango tree in the back of your house, you, you, you balling out. Uh, um, they come into your house. And I remember we used to always go to this guy's house. He had, he had mango trees everywhere. Everywhere. And my mom used to go there on a regular basis. Whenever it was mango season, we knew where we were going. However, in his backyard, he had these two huge Rottweilers. And he would tie these Rottweilers up. I guess he was protecting the mangoes. I don't know. Um, but he had these two huge Rottweilers in the back of the house. And me being the precocious, rambunctious child would look to provoke these dogs. Um, they were tied up, but I would look to provoke them. I was always throwing stuff at the dog, you know, taking leads, taking branches and just swinging it at the dog. I, and the dog would just bark, rah, 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 rah. And you know, when the white stuff started coming out their mouth, they're, they're pissed. They're angry. But I used to love it. And I was with my friends, and whenever we got there, we would just, you know, we, we'd do our thing. Now, for those of you who know, I'm sexy now, but I wasn't then. <laughs> uh, um, um, I, I didn't have it like I used to have it. <laughs> Stop it, Arnold. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> I should not have done that. I set myself up. Oh, uh, uh, if you thought I, if you think I'm fat now, you should see me there. Um, let's put it this way. My physical capabilities were very much limited. Uh, what is it? I was easy to be seen and I was horizontally challenged. And vertically challenged at the same time. It was tough. It was tough. And I had asthma. I was the quintessential fat nerd. It was horrible. The only thing I was missing was, was braces. Anyway, um, um, and so we, I was sitting there. We would just play around with this dog. 
And one day, I'm swinging whatever I'm swinging at the dog, and all of a sudden, the chain broke. I kid you not. If there was a possible speed that I could run, I ran that speed. Whatever my body could do, it did it. I started to take off. I felt the theory of relativity coming into effect. Where all of a sudden, y'all see that, right? You know, where, where, where like in Star Wars, they go to warp and everything starts like stretching out. It was like I took off. And as I'm running, I know this is a matter of life or death. Because if this dog gets a hold of me, I'm dead. He's been waiting for this moment. He's like, I was waiting for my chance. I even think he set me up. Like he was like, I'm going to pretend like I'm tied up. And I wait for you just to get close enough for me to tear your behind up. Now, I ran and I see this fence in front of me. If you ask Isaac before the Rottweiler, he would have told you, I don't know if I could get over that fence. Because I got to climb it. I don't know how it happened. I'm running, I'm, the fence is in front of me, and in a split second, the fence was behind me. And I said, that's right. That's what I'm talking about. And then you turn around, you act all bad. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. Fear will make you do things that your body would not normally do. Fear will push you to your physical limitations. It will push you to your mental limitations. You will be focused. If you ever scared, man, you're thinking about everything. Anybody rode a plane for a first time? For the first time, if you ride a plane and you're really scared and like you, you did it way later on down in life, you start hearing every part of the plane. You hear click, 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 you're like, whoa. <laughs> you're looking at everything. Somebody dropped a key. What? <laughs> we going down? We good? <laughs> right? Fear will heighten your awareness. It will heighten your intellectual ability. It will heighten your physical ability. Fear will stretch you, set you straight. Anybody seen the show, I'm Scared Straight? Right, these kids come in there acting all big and bad. Like, you can't tell me nothing. And they put these goons up in front of them. And they just start barking at them like that Rottweiler. Bop, 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 bop. And the kid's like, but you can be scared straight. So being scared is not a problem. As a matter of fact, emoting fear can be a good thing to express the emotion of. <laughs> Leave it to him to ask. However, if emoting fear propels you, the spirit of fear paralyzes you. There's a difference between emoting fear and the spirit of fear. Hmm. Are y'all with me so far? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 the spirit of fear is different because the spirit of fear, it is not Something that comes from within, but something that influences you from without, that affects you from within. The spirit of fear is not of God. The spirit of fear is not from God. But in fact, we just read in 2 Timothy that he did not give us a spirit of fear. Okay, give me a few minutes real quick. You say, well, pastor, what is the spirit of fear? If I had a good definition for it, I would define it as such, that a spirit is an immaterial, intelligent force. It's a system. And so the spirit of fear is an immaterial, intelligent system that influences and informs your decisions. Okay. Wow. It's a lot. I say that it's immaterial because you can't see it. And I say that it is intelligent because it gathers information and makes inferences and decisions based off that information. Catch this. One with the spirit of fear will take the same information as one without and make two different deductions. Are y'all with me so far? 
The spirit of fear influences you. It pushes you. It makes you do things. It makes you make decisions. Fear, that is the spirit of fear, is a form of spiritual oppression. Look at somebody and tell them it's a spirit. It's a spirit. It's a spirit. It's a spirit. That's right. That's right. And if we take inference from the text, we know what the spirit of fear does because we know what not having it does. All right. We know what the spirit of fear does to you because we know what happens when you don't have the spirit of fear. For the text says, for God did not give us the spirit of fear, but of what? Power. Can I take a pause real quick? If you have the spirit of fear, you will experience powerlessness. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of what? A sound mind. So therefore, if you have the spirit of fear, it makes you powerless. If you have the spirit of fear, it prohibits your ability to express proper love. And the spirit of fear will impede your ability to make appropriate decisions. Because to have a sound mind is to make the right decisions. Y'all out with me. There are some people in here that are wondering, why is it I keep making decisions that aren't good for me? When I feel like I've got all my faculties all together. Why is it that I feel like I can't do this or I can't do that and I feel limited and powerless? The reason why you feel limited and powerless is because it may be that you've been influenced by the spirit of You wonder why you can't love people right. Why you can't give of yourself. Why you have a difficulty getting connected and to truly love as Christ loves. And you're thinking it has to do with you getting more information, not realizing that you're being oppressed by a spirit. Look at somebody tell me it's a spirit. It's a spirit. Spirit. It's a spirit. Spirit. Is it all right if I take my time on this? Because there's some folks who think of spiritual oppression simply as somebody who's possessed by a demon. But this particular spiritual oppression is the one in which it enchains the people of God. Because we see it manifest in people who sit in the church powerless. Sit in the church unable to love. Sit in the church and ask why they keep sleeping around. Sit in the church and why and ask why do they keep making the wrong decisions? Why can't I let this go? Why can't I do this? I know I want to do this, but I'm doing something else. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. That's a spirit. Ooh. Oh man. It's kind of quiet. Ah. But if you read the text in Romans chapter 15. He begins to give us clarity and understanding that in Romans chapter 8, he gives clarity to what this is, that the spirit of fear is a spirit of bondage. It ties you up. It binds you. It keeps you from getting to your destiny. It keeps you from getting to where God is calling you. It'll keep you from going and walking in your purpose. Fear will keep you from starting that business. Fear will keep you from actually applying for that job. Fear will keep you from proposing to her. Fear will keep, can I, can I preach real quick? Fear will keep you from doing the things you're supposed to be doing. And often what happens is, is that we mask the things that we think that are good under the guise of fear when we're actually not being driven by something that's good. We're actually being driven by a spirit that's oppressing us, keeping us from getting to where we need to get. You're 35, engage with her already. You've been writing that business plan for so long. You've been talking about it. Oh, wow. Is it okay if I preach? Is it all right? Because now Paul gives clarity in the book of Romans as he writes to these people. And he's writing to these people and he's giving clarity to what the spirit of fear looks like. Look what it says. It says, but you did not receive the spirit of what? Bondage again to fear. Whoo. He's saying this, if you want some clarity. Notice, 
Paul is speaking about the bondage that comes from the fear, but Paul is speaking in more clarity to these particular people at this particular time, which I believe God is calling to us from that particular time to this particular time that he's saying he did not give the spirit of bondage. What's the word? Look at it again. What's the word? The spirit of bondage. Again. All right. Oh, it's, 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 it's basically in every version. Said in different ways. That Paul is speaking to a people who were once delivered, but now he's speaking to them again. About a spirit that's creeping in again. And I, I, I know I, I know I got to go further here, but let me just make a quick stop real quick because I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking in this moment to a group of people who, who are once free, but now are being bound again in fear. He's speaking to a people where you've been feeling again that there's something holding you back. You've been feeling again that you don't have the confidence you used to have. You've been feeling again that you can't step into some stuff God's calling you to step into. You've been feeling again and God is saying, God did not give you that spirit again again meaning there was a time you were bound that won't come back again look at somebody say i won't go back i won't go back i had that spirit i know what that spirit did that spirit kept me out of joy kept me out of peace kept me out of what god has called me to do and he's saying that the spirit is coming back again to take away your joy to take away your peace to tie you up in bondage but paul is declaring here in the text that he did not give you that spirit again He's not giving you that spiritual attack again. He, he, he's not letting you get oppressed again. And I know I'm preaching to some folks right now who if you really look and watch how you've been informed with the decisions that you've been making over the past few years, realize that what's pushed you is not joy, it's fear. What's pushed you is not peace, it's fear. What's propelled you is not the purpose, it's the fear. You're actually not running to something. You're running away from something. And God is saying he's calling a people who have enough confidence to not run away, but run towards because you can't have vision looking back. You can't have purpose looking back. If you're running from sin, be free. If you're running from fear, be free. I came to declare tonight by the power of the Holy Spirit as it falls upon me that God says tonight he wants to eliminate and eradicate every spirit of fear that is speaking doubt into your mind I declare in the name of Jesus that anybody in here who's been sleeping at night and there's a word of doubt that's been coming into them I declare it out in the name of Jesus I declare in the name of Jesus any spirit of doubt and lack that says you cannot do you will not go you cannot attain you won't love you won't get there I command it right now out in the name of Jesus and if there's anybody who's believing that God wants them to step into a new season I want you to lift up your hands right now and begin to proclaim I am free look at somebody say I'm free tell them I'm free I won't be manipulated anymore I'm not going to let the word of the enemy manipulate me anymore I'm not going to let the words my mama said to me manipulate me I'm not going to let the words my father said to me manipulate me I'm declaring in the name of Jesus no weapon formed against you Good. however I'm sorry if y'all give me just two more minutes. The same spirit that manipulates you. Oh, I hope you write this down. The same spirit that has manipulated you can be manipulated. Whew. And I'm just going to finish right here. The same spirit that's been holding you back, lying to you, and making you move in destructive behavior can be manipulated. You say to me, Pastor, where are you getting that stuff from? Well, just turn your Bible right to the next verse. It says what? The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. Meaning, if I've got fear in me, 
There's another spirit greater than that fear. If I've got a spirit of doubt in me, there's another spirit that's speaking to that spirit. And the text when it says bear witness is confirming a reality that the spirit of fear is keeping you from. Ooh. All right. I don't have enough time. All right, let me help you out. Some people are asking the question, Pastor, I'm with you so far, but why is it that I'm consumed by fear? I get it. Maybe I am. Maybe I got this fear thing going on. But why is it that I got this fear thing going on? Meaning, why have I allowed the spirit of fear to take residence in my life? Can I explain to you why? The reason why the spirit of fear has taken residence is because you've left it empty and given it a place to sit. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, there's no room for the spirit of fear. Woo. Meaning there's something missing in your awareness that only the Holy Spirit can bring. And when you don't have that awareness, it doesn't matter how much somebody tells you you can make it. You never believe you can. It doesn't matter how much you hear from the word of God you've been redeemed. You don't believe you can. But when the Holy Spirit comes in woo, and it enters into the reality of your life, and it begins to sit in you. There's no room for fear because now that spirit that was manipulated by you is being manipulated by the Holy Spirit. Because now when the Spirit speaks, the Holy Spirit speaks something else. And there's only one word that the Holy Spirit responds to because he's testifying. He's confirming with you. That when the word is being spoken against you, there's a word that's being spoken for you. And when that word is being spoken for you, that word can never return void. It's only whether you receive it. If you receive it, it can't go back void. And God's saying, I called you to be my people. He said, I will be your God and you will be my people. And if my people who will call by my name. All right. Let me help you out. The reason why, I'm out of time, all right. The reason why you're afraid is because you are not aware that you are not alone. I said the devil negative, you just twisted my brain. Your sense of fear is in the sense of solitude. That because you are, or you feel that you are by yourself. Somebody's like, I, I don't know what you're saying, Pastor. I, I don't get it, I don't get it. Ready for this? Fear exists for the sake of self-preservation. And since fear exists for the sake of self-preservation, when nobody's with you and you're on your own, the only thing that moves you is what you're scared of. And when what you're afraid of is greater than what you're excited about, you will move in the direction of what you're afraid of. Ready for this? You're sleeping with him because you're afraid to lose him. Not because you're called to be his wife. That's true. That's true. Ready for this? You wrote the business plan without moving because you're afraid to lose your job. Oh, man. You haven't evangelized to your friend. Because you're afraid to be rejected. All right, ready for this? When you operate in fear, it goes from being a catalyst of self-preservation to self-paralyzation. So emotions that would be good, I don't have the time. I'm just gonna, let me just give it to you real quick. Oh, this is done. This is done. You can take it. I don't know. Okay, there it goes. It's staying. It's staying. It's staying. 
emotions that would have been seen to be good are really fear being masked as good things. So you think you're moving in a noble way, realizing you're actually moving in a destructive way. Okay, y'all like, man, make it plain. You're tough, but you're not really tough. You're just afraid to be hurt. You look wise, but you're not wise. You're just afraid to fail. So you make wise decisions. You're independent, but you're not really independent. You're just afraid to be rejected. All right. Uh, you're friendly, but you're not really friendly. You're just afraid to be You're committed, but you're not really committed. You're just afraid of new things. The common denominator of all these things is fear. And what is it rooted in? Loneliness. Because you can be tough and be lonely being tough. You can be wise and alone. You can be right and by yourself. Whew. And the reality is in our church is we're with people, but we're lonely. We are by ourselves and we live to preserve and make sure I can just make it to tomorrow. And so we act as if everything's all right. When the reality is we're scared as life to leave that room. Because when we walk out there, the reality of life is about to hit me. And I don't know how I'm going to make it. So I'm just going to keep mean mugging people. When the reality is I do want friends. And I do want relationship. And I, and I don't want to be tough. But I feel like I have to be tough. All of it is rooted because I'm alone. And God's saying the only way I can break that chain of a fear that dominates you. And that paralyzes you. Is only when you remove that spirit and put in a new spirit in you. That now if you know that somebody's always with you. You won't ever be afraid of being alone. Because when God has chosen you. He says I will never leave you nor will I forsake you and when he says I will never leave you nor will I forsake you you ain't got to be worried about rejection because you can reject me but Jesus still loves me you can put me to the side but Jesus still loves me and if I stop sleeping with you and you walk away God's gonna take care of me because I can do bad all by myself look at somebody say he's with me he's with me he's with me <laughs> He's with me. The reason why I can tell you that is because I was poured out with the spirit. And when the spirit pours out on you, it is the spirit of adoption. What is the spirit of adoption? It's the spirit that says that you weren't deserving to be my child, but I chose you anyway. You used to sleep around, but I still took you anyway. You used to smoke, but I still take you anyway. You were a failure, but I still took you anyway. You might not have done some things that you should have done, but I still took you anyway. And when you know that you've been adopted you know you don't need to perform anymore because now God has chosen me I ain't got nothing to prove to nobody because God has chosen me to be in him the spirit of adoption is a spirit that says you are my son and you are my daughter if they don't like you know that the creator of the universe who created all things has called you by his name I've chosen you you want proof? Look at the cross. So I chose you. So what are you afraid of? Whew. When the spirit of adoption pours out on you. When the spirit of adoption is poured out on you. You say the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear 
no evil. Why? Oh, he'll never leave you. Look at somebody say, he'll never leave me. I can mess up, he'll never leave me. I can be wrecked up, broken up, but he'll never leave me. I can sin and he'll never leave me. The problem is we're trying to keep God and God's been trying to keep us. He said, even though you were a sinner, I died on the cross for you. I came down for you. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. You don't have to perform anymore. I have chosen you by my name. Do I have to be tough in grace? No. Because my weakness is his strength. Because his strength is made perfect in my weakness. Yeah. Yeah, do I, do I need to seek affirmation from people? No. You want to know why? Because he's fully affirmed me. And chosen me before the foundation of the world in him. Who should you fear? The Lord is your light. He's your salvation. Whom should you fear? Nobody. Nobody. What should you be afraid of? Nothing. You say, but pastor, I might try and fail. You're still chosen. Yes, sir. You say, pastor, I don't know what's going to happen next because I'm uncertain. Be certain of this. He already paid the price for you. He's already won the battle. And on the cross, he said, it is finished. You say, Pastor, this next step in my life, I know I got to leave. I just don't know how to do it yet next. There was a Christ who was in a garden, and he was sitting in that garden, and he said, Lord, if you would let this cup pass from me. He's like, what's next might hurt, but if you're with me, I'm going to do it. Because there's something better on the other side. All heads bowed. I want you to examine your heart tonight and ask yourself what has dominated you? Are you afraid? Or do you have the boldness that the Holy Spirit gives? Do you walk in fear? Or do you walk in boldness?